Okay. Hi, it's Dr. Sandy. Laura Kramer is one of the surgeons at Visionary Eye Doctors. Thank you again for joining us for the EYE show. This is episode 25, and we're doing a little COVID series just because I've had many patients, friends, and family that have asked me about this. And so this is kind of the episode number three of that COVID episode series. So I want to talk a little bit about all the different treatment options available for COVID. And again, this is super controversial because most of the things I'm going to talk about have papers that support it and some papers that say don't use it. Some of them are FDA approved for use in COVID and some are not FDA approved for use in COVID. But I want to go through everything. And so this will, we're going to go through a quick kind of explanation of all the key issues and all the key things that are available. And then in a future episode, we're going to go into depth of actually how they work. So this will be kind of an explanation. So there are many um, theories beside, behind COVID, but the ultimate issue is twofold. You have a virus, the virus infects your cells and leads to inflammation. And then it leads to a cytokine storm. So those are the two things. You have the virus, it's starting to replicate. And then it leads to a cytokine storm, which is inflammation. That inflammation can lead to clotting and all kinds of terrible things that are leading to people to die. So when we talk about treatments, there's two things we want to think about. Ideally, decreasing the viral load as quickly as possible. That's the name of the game. As soon as you feel, ideally prevent the virus from even attaching to the mucous membranes, we're going to talk about things that do that. So prevent the virus from even entering your cells, which is possible. That's one thing. And then the second is really to decrease the cytokine storm and the inflammation and the thrombosis that happens afterwards. So those are the two things we're going to talk about. So I'm going to show you a list of all the different options for COVID and we're going to go through every single thing. And we talk about all the variants and so forth. And some of these work with certain variants and some with not with others. So we'll go through that. So one of the best uh, ways I found to just the list was a website called Global Adoption of COVID Early Treatments. And these are the list of all the different options. So we're going to go through all of these. I put it on a spreadsheet that I'll put on my blog in alphabetical order with basically how it works the data in terms of papers and references. And so we're gonna go just through the first part. And it was very interesting to do this research because you see there's still obviously a lot of controversy in almost every single one of these different options. When you're talking about Delta variant, uh, you're talking about the Alpha variant and now the Omicron. And so what we're finding is that we still do not have long-term randomized controlled double-blinded perspective studies on 99.99% of this. So that's what's so frustrating. So a lot of the doctors are working in the dark. Uh, this is why it's so confusing to know what you should do because every patient is different and it really depends a lot on your uh, how what your genetic background is. Are you male or female? We're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. Are you diabetic? Are you overweight? Do you already have tons of inflammation in your body because you're eating tons of carbs every day? Uh, all this kind of stuff is super important to determine how quickly you should go kind of to the more advanced treatment options. So we're gonna go a little bit step by step. So alphabetically, we're gonna go through this just so you can find it on YouTube uh, more easily if you have a question about this. So we're gonna start with anti-androgen medications. So there are a whole series of anti-androgen. When we say androgen, what we mean is kind of like a testosterone hormone. So many of you know that there's been a gender discrepancy in COVID. It's been killing men more than women. And this is a big issue. And people have been trying to figure out why this is. And so it turns out that men tend to express a receptor uh, more than women. And so some companies have been some people have been doing research to find out if we use an anti-androgen as a treatment, so you have a male patient in front of you, we're going to try to make that testosterone component, that androgen component, less. So therefore, the virus will not enter all their cells so easily and lead to more inflammation. So there's a whole bunch of them. I'm going to list a couple of them here. And so one of the key ones is pro Zaxlutamine, uh, which is a second generation androgen receptor, 
And basically what it's trying to do is downregulate the expression of androgens in every cell. And so we're gonna kind of go through a little bit on how to basically understand why androgens are so important. So for anti-androgen treatments, the one that has been used the most is that long name that I mentioned, the prozaxlutamide, and which is the second generation androgen receptor uh, the antagonist, but the more commonly one is spironolactone. And there's a few more I wanna just read off to you because sometimes people will talk about this if they're admitting a patient. Uh, Finasterine, dutasterine, and also bicalutamide are also antiandrogens that have been used. So there's some papers showing that they do help. The next one we're gonna talk about is something called bromhexine. And bromhexine is, again, one of those things they might mention to you in the hospital if you're there. We generally are not prescribing it as medical doctors. It's very inexpensive and it has a very low risk side effect profile. It's been used as a mucolytic for years for different respiratory conditions. So when we say mucolytic, what happens in the lungs when you get sick with any virus, whether it's a cold, like any even coronavirus or common cold is uh, some of them are coronaviruses or influenza is it leads to more mucus, which leads to scar tissue, which leads to more mucus and you get a cycle of inflammation in the lung. And so this is trying to break that uh, cycle of mucus formation. It is an inhibitor of transmembrane serine protease 2 or TMPRSS2, which is important in this kind of component of trying to prevent further inflammation. And it also has a direct antiviral effect. So that's been used as well. Budesonide, which I've mentioned in previous videos, which I do have a picture of what that looks like. If you haven't seen the videos, it comes in these little packages. Usually it's prescribed at 0.5 milligrams in two milliliters, looks like this. The actual vial is used, one use. You put it in a nebulizer, which I showed in the previous video. This is a nebulizer here. Open up the chamber, put it in, close the chamber. Make sure your, your nebulizer has been cleaned with uh, one part uh, vi vin vinegar. I used uh, white distilled vinegar and one part warm water in a bowl. Just wash it off. Put it on, turn on your nebulizer, and then just breathe in the whole amount. This is where you want to use it. So when do you need budesonide? So most often, there's been papers showing budesonide early on for patients at risk, high risk of inflammation, really helps with the component of inflammation in their lungs. So if you're obese, you have any autoimmune disease, you have diabetes, you have any kidney issues, this is very, very safe as long as you have no allergic reaction to steroids, which is incredibly rare then you might want to try budesonide early on. You tell your doctor or you talk to your doctor about this, they might recommend it to you. And so all steroids are very strong anti-inflammatory uh, drugs. They are trying to basically help the arachidonic acid pathway of inflammation from causing more scar tissue. Inflammation causes scar tissue. And so what we're trying to do is minimize the scar tissue in the lungs. And so that's where budesonide really comes in. And this is true for all inhaled steroids, but that's the one that's been used most often. Okay, colchicine is the next one. Colchicine is an anti-inflammatory that's been used for years for gout and for all kinds of uh, inflama inflammation of the heart called uh, pericarditis. And so it is very helpful to reduce the risk of cardiovascular uh, events in patients that have coronary artery disease. And it's basically decreasing the production of cytokines. So we talk about the cytokine storm. Those in, are inflammatory cells that your body produces whenever it's hit with any pathogen. And so interleukin-1 beta is an example. And so colchicine is very good at basically decreasing that. So if you treat patients early, with this medication, this can help. I have not treated any patients with this yet, but it has been used. There's, I'm sure, papers against this, um, but there are many papers for it. It is very safe. It's been used for years. Uh, again, we still don't have any randomized control perspective studies on this, but this is something to consider. And so the, uh, let's see, I would say the COVID treatment guidelines panel recommends against this because of their studies except for a current trial that they've approved called the B11A trial. So this is again, one of those kind of semi-controversial uh, products that some patients that have gout and are taking colchicine can, uh, can kind of be aware of. Okay, the next one is 
curcumin, which is in turmeric. It's the yellow pigment found in turmeric. And it is a polyphenol with anti-inflammatory properties. And I'm a big fan of turmeric. I put turmeric on my kale. I put turmeric in my curry, of course. And then all anything I can put my turmeric in, I do. I have the kids eat a lot of turmeric. I don't eat turmeric pills, but I, I, I'm a very big fan of it. And basically it's an antioxidant. It is very effective at inhibiting viral replication, coagulation, and the cytokine uh, storm of the COVID-19 uh, issue. So, you know, a lot of these things are natural. They're over the counter. I really don't think there's that much money to be made in, in turmeric or curcumin. So the chance of that being studied long-term is very, very low, but I think it's super duper safe. So that's something to consider. Okay, the next one is called uh, favipiravir. Uh, so favipiravir is a synthetic product that was discovered when they were using uh, chemical agents against the influenza virus. And so what this is used is basically the molecule acts as a substrate for the RNA dependent polymerase enzyme, which then is mistaken as a purine nucleoside to basically trick the viral RNA strand from replicating more. So it's basically being used to induce a lethal mutagenesis in, in the virus, whether it's influenza or COVID-19. So that basically, when we say uh, lethal mutagenesis, it's causing a change in the, in the RNA strand to make it just die. And so that's been used, I think, for now quite a while in many patients that has been shown some promise. The next one is fluvoxamine, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's approved for years for helping patients. It's approved by the FDA for obsessive compulsive and depression, but it's used in COVID-19 and a similar idea. It can deactivate the actual virus and make it just not be as effective as it would otherwise. So that's something that some people have used. I don't know anyone that's used that one, but just be aware of that. So the next two are super controversial, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. And there are many papers that say these help and there are many papers that say they don't help. Uh, so it's not FDA approved. Uh, they are super safe in my personal medical experience. We've used hydroxychloroquine for years for all kinds of things from rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndrome and other autoimmune diseases. Ivermectin we've used for years for Demodex, scabies, all kinds of things. They're very safe. Everybody could have an allergic reaction to anything, of course, but they're generally very safe. So hydroxychloroquine increases the pH within intracellular vacuoles and alters the process of protein degradation by acidic hydrolases in the lysosome and the assembly of these uh, macromolecules in the endosomes. And basically it just tries to cause the virus to just self-destruct. So that's basically what it's doing from what I can understand. It's been very interesting to do this research because of course we prescribe this drug for uh, autoimmune diseases, but it's interesting of how it actually physically works. Ivermectin in the presence of a viral infection targets IMP alpha, the component, and it binds to it and basically blocks the nuclear transport of viral proteins. So the virus, even though it's, it's just RNA, is very complex. So that's another component of how ivermectin works. There have been doctors that just use one or the other for the COVID-19. And there are some doctors uh, like Dr. Sister Dee Dee Byrne that we've interviewed in the past that use both together that seem to be more effective. Again, this is not FDA approved. There are no randomized control perspective studies. I don't know of any case report of somebody dying from hydroxychloroquine during COVID or ivermectin uh, or both together. It will take years to understand in the end, what is the best protocol, but this is very, very safe. Melatonin has been recommended to use uh, during COVID and melatonin for years has been used to help with sleep, to make sure you get a deep sleep or get to sleep and then have a deep sleep. It is a derivative of tryptophan and it binds to the re melatonin receptor type 1A, which, which then basically causes an inhibition of adenylate cyclase, which then leads to the re release of arachidonate. So this component is basically trying to, I think, help with two components. Of course, helping you with sleep and relaxation, but it seems to have some type of antiviral activity, which I did not know, which is kind of interesting. So most people will give about five milligrams. That's what I used when I was sick, and it worked very well to kind of just help me, you know, sleep. So that's uh, melatonin. The next one is molnupiravir. And we're going to go through this in the next episode because this has been quite a lot. But I'm just going to read through the rest 
just to have you have the name and I wanted to mention some basic things also that I want everybody to know about at the very end so please listen through for the end so that's the next one we'll start off with with going through the mechanism the uh, N-acetylcysteine which is abbreviated NAC or NAC is used to break up mucus and I've used that before for patients with cystic fibrosis and even for people that have uh, filamentary keratitis in the eye with all these mucus strands on the eye uh, the next one is nigella sativa, which is a plant that has an anti-inflammatory component. The next one is nitosalamide, which is a broad-spectrum uh, thiazolide antiparasite. We'll go through that as well. And the next on my list is oxygen. And so we don't forget oxygen. So I mentioned in one of my previous videos of when you need to go to the emergency room or when you need to get your oxygen. And generally we do have a pulse oximeter. We recommend that anyone, everybody at home really should have one and we check it. And so if you're going below 92, 93, you probably are gonna need oxygen. Do not wait until you're below 90 because then you might actually not make it. So you do wanna try to get your oxygen, uh, at least know where you can get oxygen. The next one is Paxlovid, and we'll go through that. And that is uh, basically a ritonavir uh, combination therapy that's now under the name Paxlovid, which is a protease inhibitor, which is an antiviral, and it's now called the Pfizer COVID pill. So we're gonna go through that in the next episode. Uh, the next on the list is povidone iodine. I'm a big fan of it. It's basically antimicrobial, and it basically is trying to kill cellular membranes to destroy the virus. Probiotics, quercetin, remdesivir, ritonavir, vitamin A, C, D, zinc. We're going to go through all of those, and I'll also cover monoclonal antibodies at the very end. But there's one thing on this list that they did, they did not include on this list, which I was kind of surprised, and people are not talking about this, and I'm not sure why. It's called chest PT or chest physical therapy. When I was a resident and a young doctor, we would make our rounds in the hospital and we would always hear the chest physical therapist, there's an actually profession, hitting somebody's back really hard, trying to break open the mucus and having them cough everything out. And I really believe that that is super important with any lung infection. If you have asthma and you get sick, if you have a virus of any sort, influenza, bacterial pneumonia, trying to break open that uh, that mucus in your chest, you can do it with medications, but physically using heat, breathing in heated mist, trying to use the chest PT is super important. So please don't forget about that as well. So those are the key things we'll talk about in this episode. We'll go through the rest of the mechanisms in the next episode. Thank you for joining us. Please subscribe and please pass this on to your friends and family. Thank you.